Bobby. I'm Arnaud Bailly. I'm working, currently working for a company called Input Output. As Nicole uh, nicely put it, I'm quite old. Uh, <laughs> and uh, I've been coding software for 30 years now. Uh, that's a lot. Uh, and yeah, I, I wanted to talk, uh, so I'm, I, I would like to, I'm, I'm very grateful to Bob for giving me the opportunity to share this talk, which is about my personal experience and journey with uh, model test testing. And model test testing, more specifically in this talk, we'll talk about quick check, but in general, this is something that I could be talking about for, for hours. Um, so, of course, yes. Uh, what's not working? Oh, sorry. This. Yeah, cool. Uh, so, what are we going to talk about? Of course, uh, I will give a short intro to tell you why I think it's important to, uh, why, why I want you to talk about this and why, why you, what, what you could get out of this talk. Um, I will do a quick intro on property best testing. Um, who is familiar with property best testing? Uh, okay. Who is using property best testing on a daily basis? Uh, okay. Few people. Fewer people. Cool. Uh, I will be lightweight. We just right after this talk, we have another talk about property based testing. So will be, uh, you, will, you will have a full, uh, a full exposure to, to this uh, very interesting technique. Um, then I will talk, I will the, the meat of my talk will be on this practice about Cushy Dynamic, which is a library that we are started using a, a few years ago and developing, uh, and a bit of theory to understand how it works uh, inside, and then, of course, a conclusion. So, why? Um, my personal drive is this, 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 this quest for better software, which is quite vague. My, my, personal, uh, my personal journey has been through, so I started 20 years ago doing a PhD on uh, Finistic Machine and Automata Based Testing, which was a, a form of model based testing. Then I, I, I just left academia and discovered uh, test-driven development through agile methods at the time where agile wasn't uh, uh, considered uh, bad practice. Um, then, I, being being a Haskeller by heart, I quickly jumped into property based testing, and now I'm really circling back into this uh, old interest of mine and trying to combine all these things together. Um, this this is mandatory uh, dive strike code without which uh, any presentation on software uh, wouldn't be good. I, I never quite understood what this code means, really, to be honest. Uh, is this is this a way to dismiss pro testing and consider that it's it's worse than than uh, it's worse than, than than proving or yeah I'm not even sure personally I think that uh, software testing and testing in general and testing within the various guys is really an integral part of of programming because programs are real things and real things break all real things break so that, I think it's very important and um, therefore I wouldn't I wouldn't even consider um, not not doing it any kind of test. Um, okay, so my goals for this talk, so to share my experience about model based testing, to spark some interest uh, uh, for uh, this family of tools, and more selfishly to gather feedback and potential contributions if you are uh, interested in, uh, in, in, in this stuff. Um, and what can you expect? Well, I guess um, this is a really from the trench, uh, from the trenches we bought on uh, how, how this can be to use, maybe not in an old context, but I think in some context. Um, I will give you an overview of a very interesting tool, um, which I think is a very interesting tool, um, and I say it uh, even more um, uh, because I, I didn't wrote it, I, I'm just a user. Um, and so maybe also some tips and tricks gathered uh, along my experience on um, how this, uh, how and what to model when you want to, to, to go to that journey. Okay, so um, let's start um, property based testing. Um, so basically, property based testing is the a general edition of example based testing, where you just say, okay, if I got uh, if I got twelve, then I need to go twenty four. If I got uh, thirteen, I need to get twenty six, and then you start putting this. And this is an example driven. Uh, uh, testing and property based testing was built on the on the uh, generalization and the the fact that well oftentimes you can express 
things about your software, about your program in a way which is actually a property you want to express. Um, this is actually, this is sound kind of obvious, but as soon as you try, you often find, like, it's not as easy because what is, oftentimes you try, and when you start the journey, you try to write properties which are actually just exactly the program you're trying to write, which is missing the point because now you're just writing your program twice, which is not very interesting. Or it, it can be, but uh, most of the time it's not. So the, the hard part is finding the right properties. Um, mm -hmm. And so here are a few classical examples. I won't go into details, but this is a classical example of uh, uh, how you would express a property in Haskell, uh, where you say that all the elements of, uh, of a list are sorted, and uh, you say that, well, you, you, take a, you, you take an arbitrary list, so you, you, you have a, a, any list, and you say that if you sort that list, then um, what is the interesting property that you can have for a list that's sorted, right? Um, other classical examples are the, and that's the, usually the, the very first kind of property that you would like to, to write, is this, this kind of round trip and coding and decoding. So a classical one, again, is something that says, well, if I have a, a, an A, an arbitrary A, uh, which of course would be an actual, an actual value of something, then if I encode an A and I decode the thing I got encoded in the first part, then normally I should get back the A as a K. This is really typically uh, a round trip property. This is the kind of stuff that you would write to, for example, make sure that your CIs, the CIs in, 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 in JSON, for, for example, are, are right. Well, usually you would write, you would derive them automatically, of course, but uh, yeah, I think you, you get the point. It's not always uh, always possible. Uh, so the core features of, of QuickCheck, really, which is a uh, QuickCheck was well, I don't know if it was the first tool to do that. But it was the first I became aware of. It's a tool which is quite old, uh, nearly 30 years, I think. Um, it became as a as a, I think it, it started as an Erlang tool and then it was was formalized as a, and was more famous in Haskell circles uh, because the Erlang version uh, has been closed source for the first 30 years. And actually, people, so the Cupid company with whom uh, I worked with on this pro on this project, actually is making money with their tools. Uh, um, and and they, they generalize uh, Haskell. So the basic principles are very simple. You create uh, a certain number of arbitrary values. When then you define a property. When the property fail, this is super important. You want to shrink the failing input to say, okay, I generated an arbitrary list of hundred elements, and this list, for some matter, for whatever reason, the property I expect from a sorted list is not respected. Now I need to find the smallest counterexample which makes the property fail. And that's really the, that's why, what makes property-based testing useful, right? It's really about, it's not like fuzzing or random testing generation. It's really about trying to find the most interesting counterexamples that would make a, a certain property fail. And therefore help you in uh, really uh, the de designing and driving the design of your code. Um, QuickShake itself has uh, some additional features that are very interesting. Uh, the ability to cover the description of test cases. We'll see an example later what this implies. Uh, the ability to build arbitrary generators from smaller pieces. Um, if you are interested in that kind of thing, um, there, are, there, are, there are actually two schools in the, in the property-based testing world. There are people who say, yeah, you should build your generators by hand or by combining uh, atomic generators. And there are other people who are working on what is called integrated shrinking, which is which provides which means that you build your generators, but you also build provide automatically the shrinkers for that. Uh, I won't go into that debate, uh, but the idea here is that you will you provide the generators for your data structures. Sometimes you can even derive gen generically, um, and uh, much much more. Yeah, thank you for yeah, missing the transformation. Um, yeah. You can find more information about QuickCheck and Hackage. This is not the core of the talk, just a, a quick introduction of, on, on, on property based testing. Um, what's, so, this is classical of QuickCheck. Now, um, a few years ago, well, two decades ago, um, there, there were, people started to realize yeah, okay, it's cool to be able to write properties about pure, pure, pure functions, about, uh, um, uh, yeah, about, about pure functions. But in practice, most of the code that has bugs that is useful in the real world is, is monadic, in the sense like it has 
it has it is detectable. It manages state. It has it has impure, as we say. Um, I know people. Some people don't like the word. But I'm not very fan of the word either. But that's that's how it's called. So there was uh, a new version. Uh, so uh, the, the people behind PicCheck uh, built uh, a modic version of PicCheck with the aim of being able to run properties uh, against stateful code. So basically, you program that would run in I/O or any kind of monad for that matter. But, uh, so this is a paper which is extremely interesting. Um, when I read that paper, so a few years ago, um, <clears throat> uh, I was really impressed by the idea behind it because it wasn't so obvious for me, even though I did a PhD thesis. But at the time I did a PhD thesis, I was really, you know, kind of uh, obsessed by uh, automata and the formalism of automata, not at all really about the, the, how it could be uh, applied to real programs. Um, so the, the key ideas behind stateful, stateful quick check is to define a domain specific language of the inputs of the system and the test that you are going to, to, to test, to provide a model of the expected behavior of these actions and these inputs. And this model can be an arbitrary, it's an it's a in interpretation of these actions. And to run the model and the, set and the system and the test in parallel and um, with an, arbitrary, an arbitrarily generated sequence of actions and compare the results. And then, therefore, Usually, the, what, what you have is a conformance test suite. We say that the, 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 the system and the test must conform to the model. So it's, it's really running the both things in parallel. This is a, really the simplest form of uh, model based testing. Uh, I, I quickly started to, to um, I, I really wanted to, to, to do this kind of stuff on, on some program. And so I, I implemented a model for uh, a, a program and a software I use on the basis, which is a, a note-taking piece of software. And the, I wanted to really make sure that um, the, the, my, the way I accessed the database and the, the data was, was uh, um, respected some model without committing to an implementation. So I wrote a model, uh, a model of what I, would, what, what I expected, and then I provided different tests for different implementations, one, one, one which was purely five base and another one which was skewed. But it's not, this is relevant for the, for, for the discussion. So how, how, how would that look like? Um, I hope that even if you don't read Haskell, this kind of makes sense. If it doesn't make sense, then uh, please yell and we try to make it more, uh, more obvious. But I mean, the, the, the main idea is really to, and yeah, I have a pointer. So, yeah. so the main idea is really to say, you have, a, you have an, a, a language of actions. So in this case, for example, I have a, I can write events, read events, switch to user, whatever I can do in application. Um, then I can write an interpreter for these actions, and this interpreter will be run into a specific model. So this model here is a state I maintain, which contains various uh, data structures. Uh, and then I generate meaningful actions using some arbitrary uh, uh, instances. And um, I can run the thing in parallel, so this is a lot of code which is not very interesting. What's interesting here is the idea that you, um, um, that this is going to compare the actual execution of the, uh, of the, the, the actual execution of the actions against the model interpretation. Um, and that's, so that, that's cool. Uh, I mean, I was really happy when I wrote that. I'm not sure this is cool for you because it's just a wall of code. but. I was very happy to remember that, and it proved very interesting because it, it really um, highlight, highlighted a few issues in my code. That when I switched from a Firebase implementation to a SQLite-based implementation, I only had, I, I didn't have to change the model. That was super interesting for me, and that's really, that's really when I, when I, I got uh, hooked into this, uh, this concept. But the problem I found was that this was very hard. I did it myself. Uh, I'm not a superstar Haskell programmer. Uh, uh, everything I did was really one, 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 one thing, one of his, one of his kinds. So there wasn't really generate, the, really reuse. And the kind of properties I were, I was really testing were very simple. Like basically, you you must do the same as the model. So this means that, well, basically, uh, you only you only test one kind of property, really conformance with what, with whatever model model you have. Um, years later. Um, I, when I joined this company, Input Output, I, um, I, was, um, so I, I was working on a project, and um, this project was really, we really started from scratch, and the army was to implement uh, uh, 
some protocol. And I, I immediately started to think, oh yeah, but maybe that's really a, that's really an area where we should apply these kind of techniques. Um, so um, yeah, that's what I, I was um, kind of explaining. So when we started thinking about using these kind of techniques in our code, uh, luckily, uh, there were the people from Kubic, so the, the people behind Kubic that already had been working on the library with another team in the company to implement this kind of uh, state-based and uh, state uh, uh, model-based testing, but for a different system. And the tool at the time was very much geared toward, so it was, the, the, heart, the, the heart of the tool was very generic, but uh, in the company it was, only, it was used only for a single thing. And so we started working together and say, well, uh, you know, you are using it for testing smart contracts in a very specific formalism. We are interested in using your tool for, to test our protocol. Can we, how can we do that? And that's where the, the, this collaboration started. Um, and um, so this project, which is called Hydra, um, yeah, a lot of things are called Hydra. So what is, what, what is uh, basically just to give you an understanding of the, the complexity of the task, uh, so this is what we call a layer two network uh, on, uh, for a blockchain based on the principle of state channels. So technically what this means, uh, practically what this means, like you have a blockchain and then on top of that blockchain, which is already a very large network of people doing volume stuff uh, and trying to screw you, you, have, you, you lay out a, a small network of nodes that you kind of trust and you are doing another protocol and you have to coordinate the protocol that you are the action you are doing on layer one and the action that you are doing on layer two. So not, not, not completely trivial. Um, and uh, in a sense, this is basically just uh, a leader-based distributed consensus system at the heart. So uh, with all of complications, with the, with the added complication of interacting with the layer one. Um, and yeah, if you are interested in more details, there is a website, this is open source work, by the way, so there you, you will find uh, I mean, I have the way to prove that I, what, I, what I did uh, is, is for real. So you have all the code that's available here, and you will be able to double check. But, uh, um, you will have more details about it. Uh, so yeah, that's what I was explaining. So the R&D behind the protocol, you can see, so this is the layer one. So you have a bunch of transactions going on, various actors that are interacting with each other. And they, are, they are putting transactions on layer one. And then at some point, you go to the layer two, and you are doing other transactions, modifying a state here. And at some point, you want to put back the state on layer one. So this sounds uh, very easy when I speak uh, here on, uh, and when, when it's described on the slide. But in practice, this is extremely complicated because, of course, uh, all this has to be done in a way that is guaranteed to be safe for the users, in a sense like, we want to make sure that nobody loses their money when they, when they collaborate here. So, uh, and, and of course, not only, I mean, that's a basic requirement, but on top of that, we also want the thing to work <laughs> and to provide the service it's supposed to, 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 to give to people. So, uh, and we want to do that for the whole life cycle. And actually, this life cycle is not complicated. It, it is rather complicated. Um, what's interesting, and that could, that could become, uh, that's important in the journey, we, in, in the implementation we did, was like, uh, in all those steps here, you have the you have the you have, you need to uh, evaluate smart contracts. So basically, you need to run smart contract code on chain and make sure that this smart contract code actually will run to catch issues with uh, the the thing you are you, you are putting on chain. And this is this is an important part of the security of the system. So you have to run this. Um, yeah, and so when when you deploy this thing. What you have, you have Cardano, which is the layer one in the middle, and then you have different, so those networks here, you have, here you have what we call two heads. So we have one head here, and then you have another one here, and these are completely independent. But they, in a way, they interact through the layer one, right? So you want to make sure also that the transaction, again, okay, you want to make sure the transaction you put on layer one are, are, are correct. Um, so what we did was actually, so, we started uh, using Cricket Dynamic, so this library, that this mysterious library that we'll talk more about uh, later. Uh, and the idea was to, one of the key things that we realized that if you want to test a distributed, a distributed system at scale fast, you have to simulate the, the, the work. You cannot run for real. You can't run with all the disk and networks and whatnot. So that's where we kind of, we use um, an, uh, a tool that was 
existing within the company, which is called IOSIM. Um, and this tool allows us to simulate or to emulate, more precisely, the, uh, the, the whole uh, concurrency system of Haskell. So basically, you write your code using some type classes, and this code will have one interpretation, which is pure I.O., which will just work, uh, like usual, and then another interpretation, which is simulated, which you can actually instrument and, and, and actually work, in a, and uh, which is deterministic, and it runs much faster. And so the, the overall architecture here is that we have, we, we have those tests here, so those, those models, the, 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 the model that we use to generate tests. Uh, we, are, we have a, an execution uh, monad that will allow us to drive the various clients, and you can see here that we are mimicking the deployment of the various nodes, um, and those nodes are interacting with what we call the mock network and the mock chain. The important part is that the, 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 the things in yellow here or in orange are actually, this, this is the real code, this is the system of the test. So we are using the real hydro node, of, of course with changing the wiring, and we are using the actual real ledger that is used on Calendar on layer one to test the, the smart contracts. But of course there is, a, yeah, there is some, some, uh, some overhead in, uh, in laying out the, the architecture of the system. Um, uh, yeah, so that's what, uh, so what we realized that this, this is something that uh, is, is now quite, uh, this is becoming more and more common, is the idea that model-based testing plus, plus simulation of the environment is actually a pow powerful combination. So this has been uh, advocated and pioneered in the work by Foundation DB, and this is actually a, a, an article from, uh, 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 from, from Cubic, which is probably 10 years old or something, which is, uh, in which they introduce how they are how they were using these techniques with the Erlang using the Pulse uh, library, which does exactly that. It simulates the runtime and it allows you to instrument the runtime to be able to deterministically uh, uh, explore the schedule. So we, we didn't go that that far, but we are using the some of some of this technique here. Um, yeah. So that's uh, yeah. And by the way, this whole thing around simulation has already been presented here. Uh, two years ago by, by Philippe Kant. Um, so that was our first experiment. Um, what kind of properties do we want to test? So that's, that's becoming, that, that's really the, the, the core of the, of the thing we wanted to do. The idea was to say, well, we have a research paper. We want to implement the, 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 the protocol that is described in this research paper. What are the relevant properties that needs to be, to be, to be tested for? Well, these are the properties in the paper. So this is a, a screenshot of the actual wording of the paper, uh, how it was expressed in the paper. And this is one of the properties, one of the simplest properties, to be honest, <laughs> uh, because uh, we, we need to start somewhere and just express some kind of lightness about the, the system. Uh, and what we did was actually, so the way the Cushing dynamic was really useful for us to try to help us express this kind of properties in a way that is cl as close as possible to the way it's expressed in the paper. Of course, it's not perfect, but it's, it's, it's rather close. So we, here we, we say that, well, if we do any actions and then we get, the, we get the, the state of the model and we are in an open state, then if we generate a non-conflicting transaction out of the state and we post that transaction into the system, then eventually this transaction should be confirmed. I, this is uh, saying exactly the same thing, but uh, with a more complicated way using code. Hopefully. And I hope this is kind of obvious. So that was really something that we wanted to, uh, that, that was really where we, we started thinking that the tool was really useful in, in a way to express this kind of property. Um, and when you, run the, when you run the tool, when you run this, this property, what you get out of your system is something that uh, uh, I, I was um, alluding uh, to uh, earlier was this idea that you also get a coverage of what's been tested within your system. So you get a coverage of the various actions that have been uh, injected and that have been generated and the various traces, and you get, even more importantly, you get a coverage of the various transitions in your system. So that's, uh, that's, that's quite interesting. Uh, I will talk about this a bit later. Uh, what's uh, also interesting in what we did there uh, was we were able, to, I mean, one of the key things that you want to do with actions is to uh, simulate 
uh, and to generate action that are adversarial in here because that you want to check the correctness of your system and the, uh, checking correctness in the face of when everything is fine is of course easy uh, checking correctness when things are going awry is, is harder so that's the reason why you really want to do that and this is one of the things this is a adversarial in the sense like it's, 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 it's annoying to deal with but in the blockchain you can have usually rollbacks and they cannot happen arbitrarily so we wanted to really to simulate that and doing that was really useful to find some you know misadjustments in the way we are handling the, the protocol uh, another project that I'm currently working on, which, uh, in which we are leverage, leveraging this tool, is also interesting because so that's another protocol. I do a lot of protocols uh, those days, but uh, it's also an early, an early work which integrates uh, research, formal methods, and engineering. And the idea here is to go one step further, is really to start, because we are starting from scratch, the research paper is not even written. Uh, the idea is really to use Pixie Dynamic to be able to produce uh, executable specification from formal specification. Um, in this project, well, I, I, this is a bit a pro provocative in a way, I think, I don't know, but the idea is really to say that what we, what we will prove in Agda, because we are using Agda as our formal uh, specification language, uh, we can potentially test in quick shape. Basically a property that is proven in, in, in Agda against the model, we want to translate that property into quick shape to be able to test against the actual implementation. And um, that's what we are trying to do. It's not. It's a work in progress. So we did. We don't yet have the translation, but we are putting up the, the various pieces together to get that. So that's summarized into this uh, this this kind of workflow. And here, really, the the, the model best taste is really central, and it's really um, it's it's the main. It's one of the main outcome of this project that we want to have is to say well. If at any point in time you want to implement this protocol for real on the real network, you have tests. You have a test rig and a fully executable specification that you can plug your system in to make sure, with all the quotes you want, that the system is actually working as expected. Um, what's uh, interesting also is that this allowed us to experiment with. So I showed you earlier that in, within Hydra, we were, uh, because we were implementing everything in Haskell, uh, we, 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 we had been able to use IOC. But of course, uh, QuickCheck can do arbitrary IO, and so therefore it's not limited to testing Haskell code. And actually that's what we, 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 we are implementing here, is we are implementing two prototypes of the node that will be uh, running this protocol, one in Haskell uh, and one in Rust. And the, the, the key thing is that we are running exactly the same properties against both implementations. So we have also a way to say, well, the both implementations respect the same properties and they are really um, conformant <coughs> to the, the same model that we, uh, that, that we built. Uh, and this is done relatively easy through, through, uh, some, uh, through, through FFI. Um, so one example of the property that we are testing is this one. So this is also a relatively simple property to express. So here we have like the exact same, um, um, we have the, the two properties, one which is running against the IOC network, the other one which is running the NetSIM network, which is the implementation of the network simulator in Rust. And here we say that, well, we'd be running the same, pro the same property, but against uh, swapping out the implementation. Right. Uh, interestingly, of course, as soon as you start to cross FFI barriers, uh, you can see that you are paying a cost, right? It's not free, and uh, and, and therefore you have here. That's the reason why we we, we have to admit some secret. But this is really early work on the testing <coughs> stuff. And the, the common prefix property is expressed once and for all again. It's really this idea that uh, well, if you do any action and you take the state of your system, then you do what you you do another action. Just make sure that you have at least one action in your system. And you observe what is the best chain for all the nodes, um, then all the, the nodes should have a common prefix. That's basic. That's really, uh, and that's more or less how it's expressed in the papers. Okay, so that's um, a bit of theory. So I, I told you about how we have been using Christian Dynamic uh, in, uh, at work. So what is really Christian Dynamic? Well. It's so, so it, as, as, as you now uh, understand, it's a library for property-based testing of stateful systems. 
It's been developed by Cubic when they were working at input output, uh, and it's been open source in 2022. Uh, so we, 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 we open source the first version at the time. Um, so the principles are just exactly the same that I, uh, uh, the same thing I did by hand like several years ago, but now they are encoded and morphalized in the system. So you have, you will model your program as transition systems. The, the interesting and the, the reason why it's called picture dynamic is that you will, you express properties as, as dynamic logic formulas, which are, which are a way to express, um, to, to define those properties in a more compact way and allowing you to define different properties which, with the same underlying model. Um, you generate sequence of actions and you run those actions against the check and, and, and check the result. So uh, to get an idea of how it looks like, this is a very simple example. Imagine that we have some kind of, uh, uh, some kind of key value store and we want to model that. So we specify, so we first define the state model. What is, what is the model of our system? We have this exact same language of actions, which is uh, the, the one of the things we define. So those actions will be uh, generated in the system. Interestingly, those actions can have results, in the sense like they have a type for the result. So some actions will don't produce type, but when you get some value from a database, a key value, but, well, maybe you have a value, maybe not. And that you can check in the system. You, you start with an initial, check, initial state, uh, then you define how you are going to generate your arbitrary actions. You have your next, tech, next state transition system, so you define, given an action put, what is, my, what is, what, what is the impact of this action on the model? Um, and, then you can, and then you have a, another, uh, um, like uh, the mirror uh, uh, monad or, or time class, which is for the run model. So you, there you will define what it means to run your test against the model. So same thing, you say what it means to perform some action in some state against your, uh, your model, uh, your, your actual implementation, your system and the test, uh, and you define post conditions. What, are, what, what is the expected result of running this action against the actual code? And that's where a lot of the logic is here, because here you want to say, yeah, of course, I can all, well, that's where things become interesting, is it, is it true that when whatever you do, you put in your system, your system will always be fine? Maybe, maybe not. And that's where really the, the, there is uh, some thinking to be, to, to be had. And it, you can also, in the post condition, retrieve values that have been generated before. So this is where this uh, environment is useful. You can retrieve from the environment, you can say, well, I got some, um, I, I, I'm getting some value which is supposed to be in the, in, the, in the system and I expect this value to be what's been returned by the, by the system. Um, I will go quickly through, through dynamic logic. Uh, um, so it's a, basically it's a monad logic uh, which allows you to define properties about traces of the system. Um, uh, and what's interesting in quick check dynamic is that it's exposed both as an expression, uh, an abs uh, data, uh, pure expression language, and as a monadic uh, DSL. And the monadic DSL is actually the thing which is usually uh, more practical to use. Um, and um, it provides various combinators to relate the results of actions to the predicates uh, you are, uh, and to predicates you are having in the, in the same. Uh, there is a book about it. I, I have not read the book. <laughs> uh, it seems cool, but uh, yeah. I'm not, uh, I'm not a researcher in theory. So, yeah, quickly, what you can do, you can have modality, so to express that after some actions, some property must hold, you have the ability to describe what it means to, to what, what is true or false. So basically, uh, stop is true. If you stop the system willingly, then it, it's, it's true. And if you run out of actions to run, then it's false. Uh, you have the, the ability to express alternatives, so, uh, you, in the in the line, in the surface language, you can only express uh, angelic alternative, where you say, "Well, I have a property that must uh, hold either when I do A or I do or I do uh, B," uh, and uh, yeah, and then you have a, a, a monadic language to express this stuff and combine all these uh, various various properties. Um, uh, yes, and I, I won't go into the details. Uh, so. 
yeah, for, these are a couple of examples of the, of the, the language. So from the thread registry example, uh, which is uh, part of the system. Um, and uh, so, yeah, look, the idea is again that this is the kind of property that are reasonably readable in the sense like you, you, can, you, can, you can guess what it means even though you probably not, uh, even though you are not familiar with Haskell. If you do any action, you pick a fresh name, you pick one thread or one thing which is alive, and then you want to check that you can register, um, uh, you cannot register uh, this thing. Actually, there is a, a typo here, it should be failing. Uh, sorry for that. Um, and then you can run the properties. So there are, there are combinators and there are functions to tie all the things together. Um, and of course, the important part is really about uh, shrinking. So think about it. You have, a, you have a way to express your properties, but your property is just a language. You say, well, if I do any action and then B, then some things will happen. The problem is that you generate a random action or a random string of, of actions, and now this action fails. What you want is, well, you, you want to be able to shrink that trace. And that's where the shrinking, which is part of the uh, expressions, is, is, is done in, uh, in uh, Fisher Dynamics. Um, I won't go too much into the details. I wanted to give you an idea of how the whole thing uh, works together through uh, this, uh, this, uh, this sequence of diagrams. So basically what happens is that uh, the, the trace is generated, is generated offline. In the sense like you start from the initial state, you select actions, and those actions are selected if they, their precondition is respected, is true. Then you can generate more actions. Uh, if you generate an action whose precondition is not respected, then it's not part of the trace. So that it won't change the, the trace. Then you generate, you, you generate a, a finite trace, and you reach some state. Now, once you have this trace, you are going to run the trace against the actual implementation. And now what happens is that the, given the, when you do the action, this action produces a result. And the post condition for this action, this result in this state, must be true for the, state, for the test to succeed. You run the test, so you, you run the sequence of actions. And potentially, at some point, you run uh, in a situation where your post condition is false. And that's where you, you test. That's one of the ways your test can be can, can fail. Uh, what's interesting is that with speech dynamics is that you can also test for safety. In a sense, like you can test for something for not happening. And this is exactly the same principle. Um, you with the, the addition that an action can be considered can can be can have a polarity which is positive or negative. When it's positive, it's an action that should succeed or should have a result which is part of the first condition. But when it's negative, it should fail, which means that an action can be, um, in, in it, there, there, there is a separate set of precondition and post condition to select those. So what, what for this, given the same model, what, what happens? So here I generate an, an A, but now if the precondition for C fails, but the precondition for failure succeed, then I will generate a C, uh, and uh, this C will be generated in, in a negative position. And then the rest uh, follows. Uh, and the run follows the same logic. And now you can see that the difference is in the, when you execute the negative action, the post condition is expected to fail. So that's how you can test for both liveness <coughs> and safety properties using the same model, basically. Wow. <laughs> Yeah, but the conclusion was supposed to be long. Okay, uh, let's let's cut the crap. So I have a lot of tips and tricks. You will find them in the in the in the in the, in the slides that we'll share. I think the most important trick, the most important tip and trick is um, uh, is this one. Uh, so I love this quote. Uh, this thing that a plan is useless and planning is everything. This is something that we really find out while using this tool. Um, yeah, this is a. a well, it just happened, it's a German general, but <laughs> from the First World War, so that's okay. <laughs> that's okay. Um, actually, that's what I wanted to say, that really a model is useless, but modeling is everything. And what, what we found during, during, uh, during this work is it was really invaluable, even though I, 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 I've switched over, I've I, I skipped the slide where I explained that the model didn't find many bugs. Let's, let's, let's face it. But thinking about the model and thinking about what we wanted to do was invaluable in the sense like we found we found loopholes we found we found black spots blank spots 
it, this was not really bugged because these were more bugs in the way we were thinking about the about the moment. Um, yeah, and I think maybe we have time for questions. Maybe yes, we do. Yeah, so, sorry for so uh, yeah, this is uh, this maybe a bit fast, but okay. if you have questions, remarks, uh, please shoot. All right, thanks very much, Arno. Some example of some tricky edge case that this has found in your like Hydra and yeah. So in Hydra we found a we found a case. So actually the, the, the we work on the model. So it's it's a it's a really fresh example. So in the in the whole transition system, at some point there is a rest condition in the sense like um, something ha is happening on the layer one, and this layer one is not immediate. It's observed by the various nodes, and so. If you do something, it could it could be the case that yeah, I mean there is a rest condition, and we we realized that our model was actually not uh, taking that into account, um, which led us to think to realize that our code was not taking that into account either, and so it was not really uh, detected really by running the test, but it was detected by thinking about the failure itself. Uh, we found a, we found a real issue um, in the in the contest logic. Uh, while coding the coding the chip machine, we found a we, we found we found a bug. Yeah, the bug that and the bug was actually in the smart contracts, mm -hmm. and so the the transition were failing when we post the smart contract in the in the in, in the in the model based test, and we, so this was one uh, one of the bugs we found. Uh, I we found bugs in the model <laughs> because of course there are, and the model is pretty complex. That's what, one of the caveats about this thing, like trying to. Don't try to model everything. Try to be really tactical and, and think about what you want to model because the complexity can crop in. And modeling is code, is code too, and this code can have, can have bugs, which means it requires tests too. Uh, testing the generators also was very important. We had we had bugs in the generators, and then when we started generating more stuff, we were like, oh crap, there are bugs. Really. So. I think we have time for one more very quick question. If you say that. Modeling is everything. <laughs> this sounds like yeah. Forget about running QuickCheck itself. Just building the model is very helpful. What insights did you get building the model in terms of what is the right model methodology? Yeah. So there is a slide for that. Uh, yeah. Thank you very much for giving me the time to show you this. <laughs> uh, so basically, there are. Um, I think important things. Yeah. The the fact that your model doesn't have to be unique. So that's that's a good step about using a tool because the tool gives you all the scaffolding, and so you can focus on the important part. So, modeling different parts of the system or different thing is uh, uh, all, it removes the need to really be perfect. Uh, the idea that um, yeah, this is very important. See it fail, and this is true of any test, but it's particularly true of your model. See, well, if you think something should happen, then Make it make it fail because otherwise your model is, is wrong. So in, in that specific part here, the model is squarely state machines. Or yeah. Did I get it right? Yeah. So the, the key point is, can you model your system under test in the formalism of state machines? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, and of course, not all. I think, I mean, at at a, at a sufficiently high level, quite a uh, quite a lot of systems can be modeled. So it, it depends at which level of detail you want to go. Uh, sometimes some details cannot be easily modeled. Um, yeah, um, and other stuff here, I think, um, yeah, the, the whole question around uh, simulation is also very interesting because you want to be able to, to, to run and to generate, run, and get uh, as, as many, uh, explore as many, many corners of your, your state space that, that you can. And so being able to simulate the environment is also a way, well, it, it speeds in there, but it's also a way to explore dark corners where you can inject thoughts from the various system. That's also why we have the smart network and motion. Yeah. Uh, 